Hey, how's it going, everybody? This is Greg Brown from Foundry, and today we're going to be talking about Mari 4.1 and Color Space. We're also going to be starting off by talking about the Mari 4 series in general. And if I were to sum up the 4 series, it's all about workflow. And Color Space falls very much into the category of workflow and workflow enhancement. Um, we worked very hard with the 4 Series to make sure that we engineer a Mari that's easier to use and gives more predictable results. Mari is an extraordinarily powerful application capable of painting, I mean, you know, levels of detail that really no other application can compete with still today. Um, and that's why it's so powerful and the ability to see things in context. But there are challenges when dealing with um, very high quality assets that have lots of different source data that exists in different bit depths and in different color spaces. And in this case, we wanted to refine that process to make it easier for you to just grab textures and start painting and not get results that you don't expect. Now, if you're a 3D artist or a texture artist, you probably have run into issues with color space many times in your career in many different ways. Um, I've run into it just by texturing characters for renders and wondering why the textures don't blend together in the way that I expect them to. And that's because all those images came from different color spaces and they weren't being properly converted for my final output. You see, color space is a multi-layered issue. Um, at its most superficial level, Color space is something having to do with your display device. And oftentimes that's a monitor or a TV or a projector. And through the years, as technology has evolved, we've been able to display broader ranges of color space, which can be kind of expressed as higher saturation of colors. Our eyes can see a certain range of color and color space for display devices exists within that range. And oftentimes it's a very narrow portion of the human visible spectrum. And now as technology has been evolving, we have things like HDR displays, um, we're able to actually display these much broader ranges. But if you've been working in a narrower color space, um, that's going to be a problem for future projects. And also if you're working on a display that is a narrow range, like something like sRGB, but you want to actually display this for um, a film projector that is capable of you know, much higher range, um, then you're gonna run into issues where you've basically clamped the range of colors that could be displayed even though the display device is capable of much broader range. And what we've done with Mari 4.1 is we've engineered it to be much better at allowing you to paint in these broader ranges even if you're working on a lower range display device, essentially pr future proofing uh, Mari as we move further um, in this realm of color space, which really matters tremendously. As you can see here, if you've used Mari in the past, um, it is a far more streamlined application. What you're doing in Mari is actually something that is extremely challenging, all right? What makes Mari special is a technical challenge that is extremely challenging. And so if I zoom on out here and I take a look at this from the 3D view and I also take a look at the UV view, when you're dealing with assets um, such as this, this mech here and you want to paint it, what you have is you have channels over here. And so right here, I've got diffuse color, I've got spec color, gloss, bump. And as I switch through these, you can see that I have layers um, inside each of the channels. And each of these channels could be viewed or kind of imagined as an individual image that controls the property that it's named after. So this, this right here, diff color, controls just the diffuse color of this surface. And if I were to go ahead and switch on over here to uh, say just a flat color, this is what the diffuse color channel would look like. And then if I were to come on down here to something like gloss, um, gloss is just going to be in this case, just a black and white image, it's going to be scalar data. And so this controls how glossy the surface is. And if you'll notice each time I switch over, I've got these different UDIM spaces. And so each of these squares is an individual UV space. And this is how we achieve extremely high resolution inside of Mari is by leveraging UDIM spaces. And we don't really have all that many here. We have six, seven, 
uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine spaces. Um, and we've seen projects that go all the way up to, I believe, I, I think, or like it was like 400 or something like that. It was absolutely huge. You can paint levels of detail that are absolutely ridiculous in Mari because of the clever ways that we deal with data. Um, but you're dealing with so, so, so much data. And that's what Mari is incredible at is we don't just have one image for each of these channels. We have one image times nine for each of these channels. So it becomes a lot of stuff to manage. And so UI enhancements are extremely important. And let's just touch on right up here. We moved some of the stuff. Um, it used to just be one single top bar um, that had a lot of the, uh, the extra data um, or the extra tools also placed in it. It was very confusing. And so we simplified the top bar to make it much more constrained and move some stuff around in the interface. Like for instance, the control over your shader and your actual viewing of the, um, what you're viewing, whether or not you're viewing shaders or you're viewing channels. Uh, we've also come over here and simplified uh, ways to actually access palettes. You used to have to come up into view and palettes and choose which palettes you want and they would dock or float and you'd have to organize them. But we uh, set this up now so that you have a, an existing preset view of the various uh, palettes that you'd want to be using. And these are common like shaders, channels and layers. And of course, at any point in time, you can go ahead and close all these down and have much more of a viewport, yeah, excuse me, viewport centric view. And actually I like the ortho view, so I'm gonna hop over here. The palette toolbar is collapsible. And so you don't have to have everything displaying all the actual naming conventions. As you get comfortable with this, you can just collapse it. And this is something that I love. I like things that are viewport centric. And if you want to at any point in time, you can access some of the sub tools. We've simplified the actual tool palettes over here so that you don't have as much stuff in your way. And you can quickly access the broad range of tools that Mari makes available. Um, also, now if I were to go ahead and try and export any of my channels. Uh, this is something that is extremely, extremely um, useful. And so the export manager right here allows you to actually set up um, how you want to export all the channels that you have in your scene. You also have export overrides to actually override the way that things are being exported. And this is great for pipelines because you can actually even establish post-process commands, things of that sort. And you're able to, to manage export of all these items much more easily because when you export a channel, you, you know, a single channel um, that's flattened, you're going to be exporting nine images and that could be across a, um, you know, all the channels that are present in a very complex shader. So very useful having this refined export manager. It'll make you, your life as an individual easier. And it'll also make your, uh, the, any company that you work for life, uh, their life much easier, which is gonna make everybody happier. If everybody's happy then everybody's happier, right? Okay. Now, if I go ahead and close this scene on down, I'm going to come on back uh, and we are going to talk about how we set up a project. And so if I come over here and I said, hey, I want to create a new project, Mari, we have this new project dialogue, which is hugely, hugely useful. You can go ahead and establish exactly um, which channels you want to actually create, but these channels are actually properly connected to shaders now because Mari is capable of displaying a wide array of different shaders. Um, the asset you were just looking at was for a V-Ray material, for instance. Um, right now we have categories, for instance, the principled BRDF. And if I go ahead and pop that on open, you can see, I can say, hey, I wanna use the standard Mari BRDF and I wanna, I wanna use it for games. And we offer you some preset suggestions. And of course you can save out your own presets as well if you have a different set of requirements. And so it makes life a lot easier as far as setting up very complicated projects that involve lots of different components and lots of different channels. And so we wanna make sure you can just hop into Mari and get started painting without having to be uh, too clicky technical, I guess is one way of putting it. All right, so now that we've gone over some of the basic enhancements to Mari 4.0, let's go ahead and hop into 4.1 and take a look at and discuss color space. All right, so now we're in Mari 4.1 and let's talk about some of the more obvious changes in the UI. Right here at the bottom, the new view transform toolbar 
um, is much more refined than it was before, much easier to work with and understand the value of. What the View Transform toolbar does is it converts the color space that you are working in to the color space of your monitor. You can see right here, the default is sRGB. This asset was created using the Nuke uh, default linear color space. And of course you can make changes to that depending upon what your display device is capable of. You also can toggle off color management quickly and easily. Let's take a look over here in the channels palette and you'll notice that we have some new icons that are present in this palette. Uh, the one on the left that has numbers in it, that represents the bit depth for a channel. And on the right, um, this indicates whether or not the channel is configured as a color or a scalar channel. This affects the color space of the channel as well. As with 8-bit channels, toggling the scalar attribute will actually change the channel color space if it's left on automatic. So let's go ahead and switch that on over to current channel. And you know what, uh, let's hop on down into our gloss channel. And you can see that by displaying this as scalar data, we perceptually um, have the same kind of uh, uh, just quality of deep dark blacks. So this is perceptually what you would expect if you were painting a gloss or a bump. It doesn't look overly washed out. And uh, actually, this setting is used to drive which view transform monitor you use when being displayed in isolation. Now, the, uh, the scalar attribute will actually change the channel color space if it's left on automatic. And so if I turn off the scalar data, you can see that it goes back to the automatic setting being sRGB, but with scalar data on, it's automatically raw, which is appropriate for um, this type of imagery being used in this type of channel. Another one of the big changes in 4.1, if I come over here to my project settings, uh, we have this color space setting in the project settings. And one of the new color spaces that we've added um, during the 4 series is ACES. Um, this was done in Nuke Default, as mentioned. I do not want to switch over to ACES for this project. Um, but what the advantage is here for the project settings is we have all these preset behaviors for different aspects of texture and color data um, that are used in Mari. So in this case, for instance, the color monitor, by default, we want it to use sRGB, the scalar monitor. We want that to use raw. And so we set all these presets up. Um, like if you're looking at a 16 or 32 bit float image, like something like a displacement, stuff like that, um, you're gonna see that as linear. And so these are very important and useful aspects as far as automatically setting up the behavior of these various elements. So if I close down my project settings and I come over to the image manager real quickly, and I'll just pin that in place. Um, if you'll notice as I select any of these images, I actually have a color space setting individually for the images and under color space it says, hey, I automatically set this automatically to sRGB. And I wanna pop this open again so you can take a look at this. And uh, in this case, 8-bit color is going to come in as sRGB. And so that's why that image is automatically set to that. But you also are able to go in there and set that to any other color space that you think is appropriate if for some reason we're not interpreting that correctly. But for the most part, we will. And of course, you can also set that um, data to be um, you know, raw data or scalar data, which also makes life a lot easier. Okay. So color space, um, wow, this is a super important and interesting topic. Now we've added the ACES color space, um, the ACES CG color space into Mari. Uh, why? Because lots of studios, that is the, how they're capturing their data in ACES CG. And again, why? Well, let me just switch over here to this chromaticity diagram. You've probably seen one of these before. You might have taken a nap while you saw it. I think I may have at some point um, in my career or in my education. Um, a chromaticity diagram, very simply, expresses all the colors that the human eye can see. And uh, it does this in this curve here. Um, but there are color spaces for display devices. 
And in the case of the display here for this chromaticity diagram, or in this example, I have the example of all the colors the human eye can see, and that the straight lines, the triangle that is inside of it, that is a color space. Specifically, that is sRGB color space. And so you can see that sRGB color space cannot represent the full saturation of colors um, that the human eye can see. Lots of displays that we use every day um, utilize sRGB color space. And this is for so many reasons, um, you know, many of them being just technical challenges in being able to e express colors accurately and, uh, you know, making sure that devices are actually uh, affordable, things of that sort. And so you establish this color space so you end up seeing consistent color across a lot of different devices that um, utilize, in this case, sRGB. But technology progresses, right? And devices are capable of displaying um, much um, higher quality images in a lot of different respects. And in the case of color, um, we needed more color spaces that could be relied upon for new types of display devices that can display much more. Rec. 709 is another color space almost identical to sRGB, um, but relatively common. And DCI P3. Okay, so this is where it starts to get interesting. DCI-P3 is a color space that is used in a lot of the new HDR, HDR TVs and monitors. Um, it can display a much wider color space. And you can see, especially down over in the kind of like the, the red area, um, it, it, it makes a big difference. It's like sRGB perceptually is like sitting in the orange, like the orange area essentially. But when you look at an sRGB monitor, it looks like red to you, but you really are missing out on the deep saturations of red. And of course, um, makes big differences also as you step into yellows and greens. And if I go ahead and step on up to the next one, Rec 2020, this is uh, another color space, of course. And this is the color space uh, that is used for a lot of new projectors in, in theaters. And you can see humongous color space. It can show very deep saturation. Uh, it's unfortunate we can't teach color space to everybody because I think it would probably cause a lot more people to go to theaters with good projectors. Um, when you go to a theater, you are seeing a higher quality image, possibly higher resolution, but almost definitely much higher color range, much higher color gamut, much more color saturation. Now, this brings us to the ACES CG color space. You can see here that it encompasses all the other display standard color spaces that I previously mentioned. Um, ACES CG is a color space that is part of a larger ACES config that ships with Mari. The Academy Color Encoding System, or ACES, is becoming the industry standard for managing color throughout the life cycle of a motion picture or television production. ACES addresses and solves a number of significant production, post-production, and archiving problems that have arisen with the increasing variety of digital cameras and formats that are currently in use. There are a large variety of color spaces within the ACES config, and this allows the artist to work freely um, with many different source image and output display color spaces, and you don't need to change color management configuration. ACES CG is a color space definition that is slightly larger than the Rec 2020 color space and linearly encoded for improved use within computer graphics rendering and compositing tools. So ACES CG has become a standard color space to use in computer graphics as it can maintain the wide gamut of saturation throughout the post-production pipeline that is required for all these other display standards that I mentioned before. So for example, if you textured an asset within the sRGB color space and that asset got rendered in a wider gamut and displayed on an HDR television, your textures colors would look dull and washed out compared to the colors that the HDR television could actually produce. So using the ACES CG color space gives you an amazing baseline to calibrate your work within. So now you can be confident that your textures can be used and rendered in any other color space down the pipeline without losing color fidelity. Over the last 20 minutes, we've talked about a lot of stuff in fairly abstract terms. 
So it's probably a good idea for us to walk through setting up a project in Mari 4.1 and compare aspects of that to 4.0. So first off, you want to come over to the file menu and you want to say new or hit control N. And the first tab will be the geometry tab. We want to load up some geometry. And I've already got my FBX file. And when you actually load up a file, it's going to show you what's in that file and ask you what you want to actually bring into your, your project. Um, this mesh layer is empty because I was lazy, so I don't want that in there. And I have start frame and end frame set. This is automatic to 120. Um, there is no animation on this file, so no reason to bring in all those frames. So set that to single frame. And for channels, I probably want to use, in this case, uh, I'll use the principled BRDF non-metallic for games. You can see how it switched the depth and all the settings to be specific to um, the way that it should be set up for the shader that was chosen, the principled BRDF, and for the discipline, which in this case is games. And I want to add a normal channel, which wasn't set by default, um, because of course we want to bring in a normal map for my low res geometry. Now let's hop on over into color settings, um, right next to OCIO config. It's set to nuke default linear. What do we want to do? We want to set it to aces because we can. You can see how it set all these various elements to their appropriate settings. So for the most part, they will all um, behave correctly um, relating to each other, um, relating to color space and uh, the color monitor versus the scalar monitor. And for lighting, I want to go ahead and load up an HDR to bring in so that we have some image based lighting. All right, cool. So let's go ahead and create that new project. And uh, it'll do it rather quickly because our geometry is very simple. And you can see over on the right hand side um, in our toolbars where channels is located, I already have all my channels set up for me, which is absolutely wonderful. Now let's go down to normal because this geometry does not have its normal map applied. And uh, let's hop on down into the layer for it. I'm gonna right click on the existing layer and I want to import into current layer. And I will navigate over to the location for all my files. And they were already there because it actually searched subdirectories. Um, the images that you load into Mari need to be named appropriately with their corresponding UDIM. In this case, I only have one UDIM in this file. So I had named that actually gargnorm dot, you see at, that's just representing that, hey, there is information here. Uh, that says it's um, UDIM 1001. Um, so the file actually in Windows in this case um, says gargnorm.1001.tga. And so I'm gonna go ahead and choose the inverted one because I had to invert it ahead of time. And I'm gonna import all my patches. And there we go, great. We have our beautiful normal map in place. Looks wonderful. Now, as we start comparing, uh, some of the color space differences between 4.1 and 4.0, we're actually going to need another channel. And I wanna show you this using the, um, the base color. And so I'm gonna right click on this. I'm going to copy and I'm also going to paste. And now I have two channels and they're identical currently though. And you can see that as in the settings down here, as I switch back and forth between them, um, they are completely identical. Now, what I wanna do is I wanna make some changes to this other channel. Now, this channel is not part of the shader that we are using right now, the principal BRDF shader. The base color is part of this shader. And so I'm gonna right click on this and I'm gonna convert it. And the reason for this is because you can see down here in the settings, my depth is listed, um, but it, it, I can't change it. And so the way for you to change this is to go ahead and convert that channel and you can convert the type over to 16-bit. I also can set the color space if I want to. In this case, I'm not going to just for illustrative purposes. And I will say convert. And now that channel is different than the original base color channel. And for color data right here, I wanna switch that on over uh, because right now it is set to automatic aces.cg. And if I come over to base, base color, um, it's set to automatic utility sRGB texture, but I want to go ahead and switch that on over to utility and we'll switch that to linear sRGB. So we definitely have two different color spaces that we're working in. 
Now, we are viewing this model fully shaded, right? So any painting we do uh, on either of these channels is really not going to show up in both of them with the, the shading that we're viewing right now. I'm gonna use this green uh, to illustrate the differences as far as how the color picker deals with colors relative to the channel that you're working in. And you see right now, if I paint, nothing happens. That can be frustrating. That's because this is not part of the shader. And if I come over here to the base color, now it's actually appearing, as you can see, because it is part of the shader. And I hit Shift Control C to clear the canvas. And if I uh, were to maybe hop on over here, I'm gonna hop into my shaders because I just wanna see current channel. And I also wanna see this completely flat. I could leave it like this if I wanted to, but why not make it flat? I did that by hitting Control or holding Control as I click on this, or you can just click and drag on over and change those manually. Okay, cool. So now when I paint in the original base color, channel which is 8-bit and is set to automatic utility sRGB texture you can see how the color shows up and if I switch on over to this channel which I do not want to change excuse me and I paint right in it it is perceptually identical and I'll separate those a little bit but you can see as I even paint over it absolutely no difference whatsoever now if I go into 4.0 you can see that as I perform the same exact action um, there is a difference and you can see the difference in how the color is or how the color picker is actually behaving and so in this way it doesn't change the color picker now what happens in 4.0 is because since the color picker changes based on the channel that you're working in what you're doing is you're reusing the same values in two different color spaces which means the percep perceptual color will change and mari 4.1 well, as we switch back on over here as you can see, if I open up the color picker and I switch back and, well, okay, take a look at it in base color one, you can see that same as 8-bit data, utility sRGB texture. And if I switch back on over to base color and open that up, again, same as 8-bit data, utility sRGB texture, and then it's converted, if I'm painting in this one, um, to correspond with the channel's settings once it's actually applied to that channel by baking. And so this is very important. All right, so again, shift control C to clear this on out. And now let's go ahead over here and oops, let's switch over to gradient. And so this gradient here, um, you can see that it falls off very smoothly from left to right. Middle gray looks like it's right dead in the center of the gradient. If I go back on over to Mari 4.0 and open up a gradient there, you can see that it's, it's perceptually very different, different. The data is really the same. Um, but black is located much more or kind of squashed much more on the right hand side. This is because the gradient tool has been improved to always adjust its values to appear perceptually linear. Uh, it's not connected to the monitor setting. This is very important to clarify. It's connected to the channel data type setting. All right, so let's go ahead and come back over to our regular paint tool and you know what? Let's come to the paint through tool. Now, if I come into my image manager, I have no images here right now. I'm gonna right click and I'm going to open and I'm already in the correct directory. And what I wanna open up is a couple Macbeth charts. All right, let's open those on up. Now it's using our project settings to define the color space and color versus scalar monitor um, settings, things of that sort based on our project settings, right? And uh, let's open that image manager back up again, and I'm gonna pin that so it doesn't disappear on me. And you can already see in the image manager that these three images that you know are in different color spaces and have different bit depth settings, um, they two of them are perceptually the same, and that's because they were loaded incorrectly, usually using the project settings. But here for the uh, Macbeth Linear EXR, it didn't come in quite correctly. And so I can double click on any of these to take a look at them. You can see perceptually these are very different. You know, look at this color versus this color. And I'll open up the ACES CG. And the ACES CG actually correctly matches the sRGB and, uh, and you know, the ACES CG. So very good. What we have to do is we need to make a few changes to the linear. And so if I go ahead and come on down here, you can see the color space was set to automatic, ACES, ACES CG. And in this case, I want to come over here to utility and set that to linear sRGB. You can see even in the image manager, you can see how it changed and they are perceptually now the same. And so let's open that up. Very cool. 
Okay, and so this really matters when you're trying to, excuse me, open that up again, pin it, when you're actually trying to projection paint. And so this is gonna be a little bit funky. I'm not gonna change my view so you can actually see it. It's also using only one UDIM space. Uh, so it's very low resolution and one UDIM space and it is at 2048 by 2048. And so image manager, there you go. And we'll drop that in there. And so that is now using the sRGB and go ahead and bake. And then I will switch on over to the ACES CG. And this is important just because of, you know, the many different sources that you may get your your painting, um, your textures actually from. You may be getting some of them from the web. They some of them may be actually shot, you know, by a studio and come to you in Aces CG. Um, some of them may come out of a renderer, for instance, which would be a very good example for the the linear sRGB. And so you need to make sure you have that versatility. Um, when it comes down to uh, um, using many different image sources. Now we want to talk a little bit about painting normal maps in Mari. Mari absolutely excels at painting normal maps, um, but there are some nuances that we have talked about already in this webinar that we really want to articulate in relation to painting normal maps in 4.1. So if you'll notice over here, I already have a normal channel in my channels palette. It's already set up a little bit too well, actually. It's, it's set to 8-bit and scalar already. Um, we want to kind of show you uh, more fringe cases where you're, you're getting unexpected results and how to solve some of those problems. And so if I go ahead and come up to my quick channel and I have that set to 16-bit, good, and 2K, I click on this little checkerboard image, it's gonna go ahead and create a blank layer for me in my new quick channel, which you can see um, right here in the channel indicator, um, identified as 16-bit and color. Now we wanna switch that channel on over to scalar data because it's gonna be used for a normal map, right? And if I come on down here into my base layer and I hover over import, decide I want to import into current layer, I can find my image and go ahead and import all my patches. Now, if I toggle that off and on, you can see how with scalar data turned off, it shows up very washed out. And I can toggle that back and forth. And also note um, how it changes in the channel palette. You see a notation there. And also um, how your, your actual, uh, how it changes down here in the V transform. So lots of ways to be able to see what is going on with your manipulations of data in the actual channels. And so we wanna make sure that scalar data is turned on, great. And let's come over to our image manager now. And of course, we could have lots of images that came from lots of different sources. And so I wanna go ahead and open up, uh, in this case, an EXR file. And let's grab this EXR and open that on up. And you can see it's very washed out. And I've, I, if I drag and drop that, into my viewport, washed out. And if I go ahead and paint on it, no, 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 no. This is not the behavior we expected, right? So what I need to do in the image manager is hop on down here and toggle scalar data on. And once that happens, you can see it even displays correctly and it looks like the saturation matches. And so it is perceptually correct. And you're gonna get the results that you expect to, especially as you start uh, manipulating the blending or overlaying of different normal maps on top of an existing baked normal map. So to sum all this up, the Mari 4 series is all about workflow. 4.1 brings color space into that conversation. And I think we've done a great job of dealing with a very complex topic, the ways that color space can affect so many different areas of an application and tying it together in a way that won't confuse artists. Real quickly, just want to give a quick shout out to Aaron Sims Creative, who provided us with the model that we used in the first portion of this webinar. Thanks so much, guys. You are absolutely amazing. Your work is gorgeous, and we love having assets like this to show off our products. Um, and now we have Rory with us, um, the product manager of Mari, available for a questions and answers period, and I'm sure he'll be able to answer your questions far more elegantly than I can. He's a super smart guy and he's doing an incredible job with Mari right now. So thanks so much and uh, fire away. We'd love to hear your questions.